Spring Creek Correctional Center, Alaska's only maximum security prison. It's the end of the road in America's final frontier for Alaska's most violent criminals. This is a world where younger inmates have declared war on the prison's old convicts. They just want to fight all the time. But if I'm around that, I'm going to stab you. Where inmates can suddenly erupt in violence. I'm going to kill you. Welcome to the country club. <laughs> Spring Creek Correctional Center in Seward, Alaska. The prison was built in 1988 to house the state's most violent offenders. Hardcore felons, rapists, and murderers who will spend the rest of their lives here. Felons like Victor Stern. In 1988, he was living in Anchorage, selling drugs, when he murdered a store clerk. They gave me a 99 years with no parole. That's, that's what I was given. I uh, shot somebody. From a control tower that dominates the compound, officers are armed with assault rifles. Essential firepower if things get out of control. But even so, after 15 years on the job, Sergeant William Lipinskis knows that keeping order is dependent on the prisoners' cooperation. Do the math. There's 500 of them right here, right now, today. And there's only 26 officers on shift. If they want this yard, they can have it. They can take it. Surrounded by ice fields and unforgiving mountains, Spring Creek is the northernmost maximum security prison in the United States. Come here in March. It's raining and snowing. And with the limited light we have, and you know, it definitely has an effect on people. Spread across 300 acres, the prison has three housing units containing between 500 and 550 inmates. Within each unit, there are four modules, or mods. Here, two inmates share a cell measuring six feet by 10. House two and house three are for inmates in general population. House one is Spring Creek's ultra-secure segregation unit. For Superintendent Craig Turnbull, it's a way to control prisoners who will not or cannot stop themselves from being violent. Prisoners there are locked down for approximately 23 hours a day, single celled, and they have one hour of recreation and a shower a day, which is the highlight of their day. Convicted in 1986 of a contract killing, John Bright has spent more time locked in House One than any other inmate at Spring Creek, 12 years. He's been back in general population for just eight months. I used to fight. I fought in here, I fought on the streets, I fought for fun. So there was nowhere else they could put me because I was fighting every day and being aggressive and a troublemaker. There you go. Alaska has one of the highest rates of violent crime in the United States. With tougher sentences being handed down in the courts, the state's prisons are full to capacity. Overcrowding at other state prisons makes it necessary to send many young offenders with short sentences here to maximum security, and that's a problem. The younger prisoners don't know the established culture. There's always the challenge of long-term prisoners who have long sentences and being housed with prisoners with short sentences, and that causes a lot of friction. At 39, Donald Joseph is considered an old con and he has a history of fighting younger inmates. They just want to fight all the time. I could be around that, but if I'm around that, I'm not going to go in the room in my box with you. I'm going to stab you. Ready? Yeah, 
Today, Spring Creek is accepting a dozen new inmates. Come on, step right around the corner. The first thing officers do is establish their authority. We've got a few rules here. If you bring problems to us, we'll bring it to you. Don't mess with us. Step in here. The new arrivals are escorted to a holding room and one by one screened for drugs. Correctional officers know that a prisoner addicted to narcotics or about to spiral into withdrawal is a major security threat. Let's get these guys secured. But drugs aren't the only problem. Many of these violent offenders may be affiliated with gangs. Determining which inmates have these ties is critical. The officers are looking for what they call Gang Inc. Each prisoner has his tattoos photographed and documented. Any officer can go into our database and look at the prisoner and look at the tattoos that they had when they came in. It's illegal to get ink in prison. Anyone caught doing it will get time added to his sentence. The security sergeants reviewing all their files, looking for any sort of hint of issues. Maybe we need to put them right in the segregation unit coming from the van. Post two, can you activate post three and 54 Bravo, please? Prison officials are vigilant about young, more violent inmates with something to prove. Don't have to go, though. Come on. You. The younger kids that are coming through here, they act like this is a rite of passage coming to prison. Lifer Victor Stern agrees. So you got all these young kids going in, so now the whole demographic has just changed. I mean, these guys don't care. They're just in and out. Have they got nothing to lose? Sean Belknap is the type of kid Stern has a problem with. He has a long criminal history of assault and auto theft. He's currently serving 40 months for violating his parole by driving while intoxicated. His short sentence means correctional officers and lifers will be watching him closely. Belknap, B -E -L -K. N -A -P. An inmate like Belknap would normally serve time in a medium security facility. But due to overcrowding and a reputation for violence, he's here at Spring Creek. I've been in and out of the system most of my life, so fighting has been a big thing with me. So usually I go to medium facility, but not now. For Belknap and other new inmates, violent confrontations like this one in the gym are common as they try to establish their place in the packing order. Officers use pepper spray and contain the fight within seconds. The perpetrators are led in handcuffs to segregation, house one. Convicted murderer and lifer Ronald Smith has been in Spring Creek for the last seven years. He's seen his share of fights started by young short timers. So I got young punks running around here acting like they're all badass, and it's like, whoa, slow, slow down. You know what I mean? Cool your jets. This ain't no game, man. You taking it like it's a vacation because you're going home in 60 days, in one year, 18 months, whatever it is. You know, I'm going for an 85-year, you know, bid. This isn't fun. You know, I mean, you know, and in real jails, people lose their lives behind these walls every day. The old timers, they're used to the schedule. They know what to expect from us. We know what to expect from them. These new guys, they, they come in here and they act like we're going to reinvent the wheel just because they're here. You know, and none of them want to do life. They want to just get a little taste of it so they can go out on the street and tell their friends, you know, I've been to prison. You know, they act like, I'm, I'm in the big house now and I own it. Well, you don't. And then there are prisoners like these. The prison's 54 mentally ill inmates. Assigned to echo module in house two, many of these inmates can be extremely unpredictable and violent. They can become unstable in a very short period of time. A little over 125 miles from Anchorage and surrounded by natural beauty, Spring Creek Correctional Center houses Alaska's most hardened offenders. Lockdown! Lockdown! And deep inside this maximum security prison in House 2 is a unit holding the most volatile prisoners. It's called Echo Module. Echo is home to the prison's mentally ill and criminally insane. 
They're very unique because a lot of them can turn on a dime for whatever reason. Whereas in a normal general population mod, you can sort of see things starting to simmer and bubble, and then you can intervene. And these guys are very challenging. In the United States, one in six prisoners is mentally ill. And in Alaska, 12% of inmates exhibit mental illnesses like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Dennis Perry has the difficult task of keeping the inmates of ECOMOD from becoming violent. ECOMOD, it's a chronic or long-term mod that uh, is reserved generally for the mentally ill and uh, chronically mentally ill. We try to have as many officers um, observing as we can. ECOMOD exists to isolate these often heavily medicated inmates from the general population. It also keeps their powerful mood-altering prescription drugs out of other inmates' hands. There are a lot of people in the institution that would love to pass their time uh, with some aid, and uh, so medication becomes a real commodity, and they have to be protected from the rest of the population. Ernest Rogers is serving 85 years for attempted murder. In prison, his bipolar disorder is kept under control. Without medication, he could easily become violent again. I'm fully responsible for what I did to get in here. And I've always said that. I, I've never denied what I did. In Echo, inmates have their medication regime strictly monitored. If they feel you're a security threat or a a threat to the institution by not taking your medication, they're gonna lock me up. I need my meds no matter what. No matter what, I need my meds. Without those meds, Rogers was prone to extreme and violent behavior. During his first five years at Spring Creek, his outbursts often landed him here in House One, the prison's segregation unit. I've been to the place, even in prison, to where I don't need these and screw these and you know, that's, this ain't gonna affect me that much. And you know, I did two years in house one for being non-med compliant and threatening people and stuff like that. Correctional officers know that they must constantly monitor prisoners like Rogers, who sometimes refuse to take their meds. Often inmates pretend to take them, but hold them in their cheeks, later spitting them out. It's called cheeking and it's led to trouble with Ernest Rogers. If you watch him, he cycles. And about every two years, he's either cheeking it or not taking it at all. And he starts getting aggressive in his tendencies. Um, he's a big guy, so he stands out. And I think because of his size, it usually ends the same way. It ends in having to take him down with force. And it usually starts with him swinging on one of us. And it takes five of us to get restraints on this guy. This video footage captured by prison officers reveals what can happen when an inmate stops taking his medication. After refusing to take his meds, the prisoner snaps. Within minutes, he's extremely aggressive. Strapped into an emergency restraint chair, he continues to resist. Screaming, the prisoner spits at the officers, possibly exposing them to hepatitis or something even more serious. The rate of HIV infection is up to six times higher for prisoners than for the public at large, so the officers have to protect themselves. They cover the prisoner's head with a spit hood. Officers are not allowed to give details about this inmate. But they say he has since served his time and has been released back into society. There are also prisoners who aren't mentally ill, but are simply too violent and disruptive to be in Spring Creek's general population. They live in a tightly controlled, specially built unit. House One that segregates them from other inmates and allows correctional officers to control them. And they're there until they're appropriate, their behavior is appropriate, because they're not gonna let them disrupt the general population. Welcome to the country club. 
<laughs> Spring Creek Correctional Center, located on the isolated Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. They call Alaska the last frontier. It really is, because a lot of people are oblivious to what goes on up here. But for some inmates, this isn't isolated enough. They're so disruptive or dangerous, they need to be kept in House 1, the segregation unit. Here, there are 64 6 by 10 foot cells. All inmates in segregation are kept in lockdown 23 hours a day. It's a jail within our prison. House 1 also houses our maximum security prisoners who have been classified as uh, disruptive to the facility, a danger to other prisoners. Each prisoner here is allowed one hour outside of his cell for recreation. The small individual exercise spaces are surrounded by concrete and razor wire. Put your hand on the wall. Do it now. OK. Go in house one. For what? Fighting and violent confrontations like this one, captured on closed circuit TV, are among the top reasons inmates wind up in segregation. Donald Joseph has been placed in segregation many times. He's a violent offender serving time for attempted murder. I just said, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this guy's lights off. He earned his first trip to House One after he got into a fight with a group of inmates who were brandishing homemade weapons. They kept trying to sneak up on me with their little shivs and their little mop handles and stuff. I told them they were a bunch of little punks. Joseph claims he was just fighting back. I grabbed his shirt and stabbed him in his face, and they all started screaming and yelling at me, and they ran down the hallway. After officers broke up the fight, they put him in segregation. Surrounded by violent offenders like Joseph, the correctional officers take no chances. Here, all movement of inmates is strictly regulated. At all times, prisoners are in chains, escorted by one or more officers. But 95% of their time is spent in their cells. Because they can't see each other, their only way to communicate is through the walls. You always need to watch yourself. They're in here for a reason. Everybody who gets moved in this house is in some kind of retainer, some kind of cuff. Some of these guys are too bad, so they get legs. They get put in belly chains and, and legs. Uh, I'm going to have you step out. We'll get this guy. I thought he was already out of here, This inmate has a reputation for spitting at officers. They have been forced to put him in a spit hood, which he must wear from his cell to the recreation area. He spit on one of the officers from another location, and we enforce that all the time. Inmates who consistently challenge authority are quickly identified and constantly monitored. House One prisoners are issued red uniforms, which stand out from the yellow other prisoners wear. The red is a constant reminder to officers that they are dealing with the most dangerous inmates. Don't care where they came from. We know why you're here. They come in here, we strip them out, we put them in red. We give them three changes of clothes. We give them new linen. We give them what we call a sack. Gives them their soap, toothpaste. Cells in this unit have color-coded signs placed on the doors to classify the inmate inside. White blue, green, and pink. Pink cells house inmates that have a record of assaulting staff. Two officers must be present at all times when a pink cell door opens. Pink cells are placed on the ground floor as a safety measure for the officers. Lower tiers are always down on the floor. No one taking any chances being up high. On the second tier, officers run the risk of being pushed over the handrails. So there's always two-man coverage on those guys, um, always in hands and leg restraints. Despite this strict punishment, some of these prisoners do not seem to learn from the experience. We've had guys leave and come right back the same day. 
We had one guy, he saw somebody he didn't like that was mouthy to him in here, went straight for him. All right, back in. He was out five minutes. Convicted murderer John Bright is one of those inmates who keeps winding up in House One. I did years, you know, for beating a guy almost to death over there in, uh, in Kilo Mahade. And I tried talking to him. And I'm telling this guy, look, man, just stop. He just didn't want to stop. It ended up being six years in the hole. But even after his six years were up, Bright could not stay out of trouble. He spent another six years in segregation for fighting. Just recently, when he was put back in general population, he claims prison officials gave him a final warning. I can fight. You can look at my hands. They, they look like they bend down the ringer, and they are beat up. But they told me, if you hurt one more prisoner, just one more, I'm going to put you in the hall and never let you out until you die. Corrections officers hope Bright has finally learned his lesson. But they aren't optimistic that he'll be able to avoid new fights with other inmates. He's going to do what John does. And when he does it, he's going to say, hey, you know how I am. I'm not going to walk away. Sometimes a guy just needs a good ass kicking. That's what John will tell you. Alaska Spring Creek Correctional Center. Inside these walls are some of the state's most dangerous criminals. For 20 years, this prison has housed inmates with long sentences for violent crimes, like armed robbery and murder. But Spring Creek is changing. With many of Alaska's medium security prisons filled to capacity, Spring Creek has had to open its gates to a new type of inmate, young prisoners serving shorter sentences. And for corrections officers like Eric Torrey, it only makes the job of keeping the peace much more difficult. We're going through right now a little bit of growing pain our transition time. That's when there's a potential for uh, disturbance. Officers and long-serving inmates agree that the influx of new prisoners is making Spring Creek an even more dangerous place. Yeah, you have to be vigilant and on guard all the time. Realize and understand that all these guys are predators, that each of them has left a victim on the other side of the fence, sometimes quite violently. These cats coming in with a short time, you know, they really don't care. They got nothing to lose. Victor Stern came to Spring Creek in 1989, a convicted murderer sentenced to 99 years with no chance for parole. When Stern first got here, he was ready to do battle. My mindset was to kill. Anybody mess with me, I'm gonna kill them. Okay, so I'm either gonna kill or be killed. Over time, he has learned the rules of the prison, but never lets down his guard. Stern has no tolerance for the young inmates looking to earn a reputation on the cell block by picking a fight with him. For these new inmates, this is called making bones. Victor Stern, any of those old-time guys, they're darn sure not going to be punked out by another prisoner. The only way that they can do that is to make their bones, and they do that earlier in their career. They get this idea in their head, well, I'll be the guy that, that breaks him, or I'll make my bones on this prisoner. 26-year-old Sean Belknap is one of those men looking to make his bones. This is his first time in a maximum security facility. He's doing a 40-month sentence for felony DUI. I'm not saying I'm a hardened criminal or a convict, you know. But I'm almost there. I'm getting there. After this little bit, I'll be. The officers know it's just a matter of time before a younger inmate like Belknap and an old-timer like Stern flash head-on. They're gonna run up against somebody that's been in prison longer than they've been alive. They're gonna disrespect them and wake up looking at the, the ceiling, you know? I don't put up with the crap. No, I Come on with it. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Throw me in jail? Oh, well, throw me in hole? Wow, 30 days. I don't care. Let's go. You know, I'm not gonna have you disrespect me for some stupid shit. The overcrowding only adds to the problem. You're in prison. You put a bunch of kids, boys, men, young men, in prison together on a postage stamp for years. You're going to have violence. That's what boys do. I'm cool with that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how crazy it is here. 
John Bright has been attacked by a younger inmate in Spring Creek. And my cheek was shattered. Yeah. Cheek shattered. Uh, septum broke. Snuck up on him. Wasn't even man enough to just stand toe to toe with him. Just snuck up from behind. The officers know what that violent young inmate had in mind. He gets grief based on just his reputation. I'll make my bones off John Bright. I'll beat up John Bright. That'll get me some respect on the yard. But it didn't work out that way. Bright quickly got the upper hand. Ricky Nelson was one of the first officers on the scene. Bright was on the ground with the other prisoner, and he was getting ready to start tearing him up. And the kid, there was nothing he could do. And it was not going to be a pretty sight, because the kid was not going to win. There's an old saying, if you knock me down, pray I stay down. But Bright maintained the prisoner's strict code of silence. Even though he was the victim of an attack, he didn't register a complaint against the younger inmate. When you're done being a thug and want to go just break the law and lay up in the cut, come holler at us. It's the us and them thing, and so I can't tell on him. You don't do that. Black guys don't tell on black guys. White guys don't tell on white guys. This is the rules, our rules. Those unwritten rules mean that prisoners will find their own ways to get back at their attacker. It also makes the job of investigating what happened very difficult. The standard response is, you know, to questions of a black eye or, or physical injury is, oh, I got that in basketball. That's, that's the standard response. Convicted murderer Craig Hall is another older con. He has been here at Spring Creek since it opened in 1988. I made a bad choice one night, 20-something years ago, you know, and ended up in prison because of it. Killed a man. Here I am. Years later, he became the target of a group of younger prisoners. By younger guys, guys, there was four of them. You know, snuck up on them, trying to make their bones. Let's do that guy. And they did, and, and they beat him down pretty good. Officers eventually discovered what happened. But despite his beating, Hall refused to name his attackers. Yeah. I interviewed him right after he got beat up, and I knew what to expect walking in there. He ain't going to tell me nothing. He held his chin high that whole time, never said a word. True convict. He ain't ratting, he ain't telling. He'll take care of it, you know? Older convicts like John Bright and Victor Stern know that another fight is always just around the corner. We're all smiling. Three minutes from now, we'd be standing here talking. Somebody would be able to get their head beat in. It could happen at any time because you don't know what's going on in somebody's mind. It could, so it could happen. You never doubt that. The tension of inmate-on-inmate inmate violence is constant. On this day, there is a fight in the gym. You guys want to see if we got a fight here? Through the window? It is the second fight of the day. Both of these inmates are headed to the segregation unit. Dealing with guys that know how to do time is a lot easier than dealing with guys that don't know how to do time. No matter what the threat, officers try to stay one step ahead of the 500-plus inmates who have nothing better to do than hustle and scheme. In prison, there's a dangerous black market in tattoos. At Spring Creek Correctional Center in Alaska, there's constant tension between inmates and staff. To keep the peace, correctional officers need to maintain tight control. At 9 p.m. every night, inmates in general population houses two and three return to their cell blocks from work detail or the yard. The next two hours, they will have open recreation within their mod. Lockdown. Lockdown, guys. 
Officer Cynthia Beadsley keeps a watchful eye on which inmates are spending time together. It could be just socializing, or they could be planning something illegal. Whisper, whisper to this group, and whisper, whisper to this group, and, and they'll watch where the COs are so that COs don't overhear them. And then we know when certain people get together that aren't normally together with each other and they start talking, there's something going on. To keep track of who's talking to whom, Spring Creek has covered the prison with cameras. There's cameras everywhere. They're putting up more cameras right there. There's going to be three cameras right there. And in that back corner back there, mm -hmm. upstairs, there's two more. Closed circuit cameras caught this fight in the entrance to the gym. Officers try to stop fights early. They know that small fights can escalate into big ones. My primary concern when I find somebody that's beat up like that, is it over? If I don't deal with it right now, and deal with it the right way, it's gonna get bigger. It's gonna be some big dramatic thing that's gonna affect the whole institution. To stay on top of these situations, Officer Ricky Nelson remains on watch, looking for subtle changes in inmates. If there's something wrong in the mod, you can actually walk in. You just can feel the tension in the air. You just don't know what it is. And you start going around talking, getting do a general barometer check. You know, you got your key prisoners you can talk to and work from there. Officers try to form a relationship with key prisoners and turn them into informants who divulge information about their fellow inmates. But if an inmate gets a reputation as a rat or snitch, he will pay a heavy price. There's rats in my mind. I tell them, I don't know what the talking to me, but if you ever talk to me again, I'm gonna slap your mouth out there to the bay and the sea otters are gonna play with your lips. There's a dude, he's wound up there because every month he goes to, he tells, and he openly tells. You know, the only solution for this dude is to kill him. Information obtained from inmates often results in cell searches. For Officer Eric Torrey, it's a constant cat and mouse game. He knows that while he watches the prisoners, they in turn are watching him. I'm only here half the time, they're here all the time. And they probably know more about me than I know about myself. My mannerisms, my habits that I take for granted, they're very much in tune to those. They know what they are. So I accept that and I just try to be as spontaneous as I can. 31, you got crew in Gulf 13. Conducting a cell toss is one way officers can stop fights before they begin. The prisoner is very particular and organized. Now, I'm looking around here. I see one piece of disorganization. Spring Creek's officers regularly discover homemade knives, or shanks, and drugs. In this cell, Tori doesn't find a weapon, but something almost as valuable. I go through all these books, but I, I, I have a target area here I'm focusing on. What's this? Don't move. Bingo. One tattoo device. Nice. Motor, battery, needle, the whole deal. Following the discovery of the tattooing equipment, the inmate will face the prison's disciplinary board and be sent to segregation if charged. Tattooing with dirty needles causes infection, creating a major health hazard, and can spread hepatitis or HIV. Inmates may also use their tattoos to advertise their gang affiliations. Despite the efforts of officers to clamp down on this underground activity, tattooing remains a big part of the prison's culture and its black market. With low-paying prison jobs as the only legitimate source of income, tattooing is one of the oldest ways to make the cash prisoners can turn around and spend on contraband. I'm trying to get my little hustle on, trying to make money. So I gave this guy some commissary for his motor and decided that I'm a tattoo guy now. And uh, I convinced my celly that I knew what I was doing. 
and uh, he gave me $25 to put a Siemens anchor on his arm. And before you get to work, you gotta have your DEF CON 1 escape plan. Okay, so I got this kid watching for us, and he goes, Raid! They're screaming, lock down, lock down now. This time, Joseph hid the tattoo device in his rectal cavity and avoided punishment. But that's not always the case. We make efforts to find all the equipment and, and shut it down because what it does is it basically the person's establishing a business here. This one right here hurt the most. It's getting one over on the man. You know, the middle of the night, they're doing their tattoo work. Part of the package just their badge of honor when they hit the street is, I got to get my sleeves done before I get out. The officers know tattoos or anything else that has value can serve as a flashpoint for violence. From soups to sex is currency. What we do is our best. You know, here's the evidence. We do quite a good job of, of, of cracking down on that, keeping it in line as best we can. For the officers of Spring Creek, the ground rules are simple. Stay vigilant. Complacency will get you killed. Uh, give me one second. And keeping one step ahead means preparing for the worst. They just want to go to war. And away we go. The number one job for officers at Spring Creek Correctional Center in Alaska is to keep the peace. Some inmates here are locked down for up to 23 hours a day. But sometimes officers order prisoners to leave their cells, whether for medical treatment or cell inspection. And all inmates must obey. Let me talk to you. Need to have you come over the door and let's cuff you up. Get you over to talk to mental health. If a prisoner refuses to leave his cell, officers must call in a specially trained cell extraction team. That's the prisoner's decision that the team assembled because we afford them every single opportunity to comply. But you have to come out. And this is always has and always will be our last resort. The goal is to remove the prisoner from his cell without the inmate or the officers being injured. It is one of the most explosive and dangerous parts of an officer's job. Handling this situation requires extensive training. So strike and... That's why Sergeant Gary Elvey is training Spring Creek's elite six-member extraction team. Okay, you know your way home from there. Be sure of your target as well as your surroundings. Because he's coming. He's been with the team for over five years. The training is for a cell extraction. I'm going to back in, met in the medical department in the facility in one of the isolation cells. This particular scenario calls for an extraction of a potentially mentally unstable prisoner. We have a prisoner who is refusing to be restrained to come out for medical treatment. The inmate, played by an officer, is not taking his medications. Arm, arm. We'll start with you know, officers on the shield, arm, 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 legs, legs, and then come back in. So we try to get it as realistic as we can. The officers must enter the cell and forcibly administer the drug. We'll go at your pace, OK? You guys are going to go at his pace. He's going to dictate it. First, the officers order the inmate to put his hands through the hatch so he can be cuffed. Come to the door and cuff up. You need to cuff up! When the prisoner doesn't comply, the team prepares to enter the cell. They secure their protective helmets, vests, and shields. Shields down. Rock roll. Then they enter the cell. The team swarms the prisoner and takes him down. Stop resisting! Stop resisting! They restrain him with cuffs on his wrists and ankles. Then they lead him out of the cell and administer medicine without injuries on either side. This drill and others like it are repeated until LD is convinced the team is prepared for any move a prisoner might make. Stay focused. Line up, get your position, get the tools, tap in. The most dangerous extractions often happen in the segregation unit. 
That's what happened with Donald Joseph, who's serving 26 years for attempted murder. While on lockdown in his cell, Joseph was accused of refusing to give up his food tray. It was a small but important challenge to the officer's authority, and they called for an extraction team like this one. They'll just get on the radio when they're picking trays up at dinner time and say, so-and-so refused to give us his tray. And then they'll put the curtains, they got black curtains, they'll put them all over all the windows so that nobody can see. To make sure Joseph wasn't trying to lure them into a fight, officers preemptively used their most powerful non-lethal weapon, a pepper spray gun. It temporarily blinded Joseph, allowing them to get him out of his cell. It sounded like a space shuttle launching when they sprayed you with it. The goal was to end the conflict decisively and quickly. Joseph fought back, but was restrained. The officers at Spring Creek know that the next violent outburst can happen at any time and any place. Especially now, as the population here gets younger and younger. Where are the guys that are leaving? The PMs are down there. Yeah, they're down there. On this morning, these men are escorted from their cells. They will be transported to Arizona. Among those leaving are many of Spring Creek's oldest cons. They're being transferred out of state to make room for other inmates in Alaska's crowded prisons. We're waiting for one more record from uh, medical. And as they leave, new prisoners, among them the young and violent, enter the tightly packed cell blocks. We're going to try and get uh, probably about 30 out of here in the next week, which means they'll bring us 40 um, the nature of the beast. So we're getting ready for that, um, expecting them around 1 o'clock. Out with the old, in with the new. It's how things work at Spring Creek. Back up to the guy in the wheelchair there. Maxed out. Really? When they get here, they're happy to be here. Especially these young guys walking in here. This is a badge of honor. Now they got to go show that badge off. That's the same guys that brought them here the first time. Here we go, you know. Welcome back. Yeah, sad. I've been in 20 years, and I've seen guys come in 10 times, just back and forth. It's just a revolving door. Every two or three years, you see the same guys come back and forth, back and forth. Here at Spring Creek and the hundreds of prisons like it across the nation, the conflicts between young cons and old cons, between inmates and officers, continue. Don't get overconfident. Don't think that, oh, they're never going to get one over on me. Every day, someone's going to try. And every once in a while, it's going to happen. My job basically is to uh, enforce the rules. Fair, what's fair is fair. What's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. And like I said before, if the guys, the prisoners have it coming to them, the answer is yes. If they don't, it's no. And there really isn't much gray area in between. At Spring Creek, every day holds a new challenge for the officers and the possibility for violent confrontation. For them, the goal each day is the same. Stay alive and keep the peace. and House 3 are for inmates in general population. House 1 is Spring Creek's ultra-secure segregation unit. For Superintendent Craig Turnbull, it's a way to control prisoners who will not or cannot stop themselves from being violent. Prisoners there are locked down for approximately 23 hours a day, single cells, and they have one hour of recreation and a shower a day, which is the highlight of their day. Convicted in 1986 of a contract killing, John Bright has spent more time locked in House One than any other inmate at Spring Creek. 
12 years. He's been back in general population for just eight months. I used to fight. I fought in here, I fought on the streets, I fought for fun. So there was nowhere else they could put me because I was fighting every day and being aggressive and a troublemaker. There you go. Alaska has one of the highest rates of violent crime in the United States. With tougher sentences being handed down in the courts, the state's prisons are full to capacity. Overcrowding at other state prisons makes it necessary to send many young offenders with short sentences. But drugs aren't the only problem. Many of these violent offenders may be affiliated with gangs. Determining which inmates have these ties is critical. The officers are looking for what they call gang ink. Each prisoner has his tattoos photographed and documented. Any officer can go into our database and look at the prisoner and look at the tattoos that they had when they came in. It's illegal to get ink in prison. Anyone caught doing it will get time added to his sentence. The security sergeants reviewing all their files, looking for any sort of hint of issues. Maybe we need to put them right in the segregation unit coming from the van. Post 2, can you activate post 3 and 54 Bravo, please? Prison officials are vigilant about young, more violent inmates with something to prove. Don't have to go, Come on. You. The younger kids that are coming through here, they act like this is a rite of passage coming to prison. Lifer Victor Stern agrees. So you got all these young kids going in, so now the whole demographic has just changed. I mean, these guys don't care. They're just in and out. They got nothing to lose. Sean Belknap is the type of kid Stern has a problem with here to maximum security, and that's a problem. The younger prisoners don't know the established culture. There's always the challenge of long-term prisoners who have long sentences and being housed with prisoners with short sentences, and that causes a lot of friction. At 39, Donald Joseph is considered an old con, and he has a history of fighting younger inmates. They just want to fight all the time. I could be around that, but if I'm around that, I'm not going to go in the room and box with you. I'm going to stab you. Today, Spring Creek is accepting a dozen new inmates. Come on, step right around the corner. The first thing officers do is establish their authority. We've got a few rules here. If you bring problems to us, we'll bring it to you. Don't mess with us. Step in here. The new arrivals are escorted to a holding room and one by one screened for drugs. Correctional officers know that a prisoner addicted to narcotics or about to spiral into withdrawal is a major security threat. Get these guys secure. They gave me a 99 years with no parole. That's, that's what I was given. I uh, shot someone. From a control tower that dominates the compound, officers are armed with assault rifles. Essential firepower if things get out of control. But even so, after 15 years on the job, Sergeant William Lipinskis knows that keeping order is dependent on the prisoners' cooperation. Do the math. There's 500 of them right here, right now, today. And there's only 26 officers on shift. If they want this yard, they can have it. They can take it. Surrounded by ice fields and unforgiving mountains, Spring Creek is the northernmost maximum security prison in the United States. Come here in March. It's raining and snowing. And with the limited light we have, and you know, it definitely has an effect on people. Spread across 300 acres, the prison has three housing units containing between 500 and 550 inmates. Within each unit, there are four modules, or mods. Here, two inmates share a cell measuring six feet by 10.
Spring Creek Correctional Center, Alaska's only maximum security prison. It's the end of the road in America's final frontier for Alaska's most violent criminals. This is a world where younger inmates have declared war on the prison's old convicts. They just want to fight all the time. But if I'm around that, I'm going to stab you. Where inmates can suddenly erupt in violence. I'm going to kill you. Welcome to the country club. <laughs> Spring Creek Correctional Center in Seward, Alaska. The prison was built in 1988 to house the state's most violent offenders. Hardcore felons, rapists, and murderers who will spend the rest of their lives here. Felons like Victor Stern. In 1988, he was living in Anchorage, selling drugs, when he murdered a store clerk.